You're watching Source Material. Source Material is a brand new series from Digital Spy. And in today's edition, we're going to discuss The Sandman, which is Netflix's adaptation of Neil Gaiman's comic book series. And it's something we've been waiting for for a very long time. So first up, we're going to talk about the original comic book series that Netflix's Sandman is based on. So here's everything you need to know about the Sandman comics. Now, this was created by Neil Gaiman back in 1989. It ran for 75 issues up until 1996, but there were also some spin-off comics and there's been a lot of little dips and dives into the Sandman world ever since. So Neil Gaiman's Sandman show and the comic both star Morpheus. Now he is the dream, he is dream of the endless. So he is an ethereal being who basically represents dreams and nightmares and everything that goes on when we're asleep. But before all that, before 1989, DC Comics did introduce a few other versions of the Sandman beforehand. So back in the 30s and 40s, there was a character called Wesley Dodds. He named himself the Sandman as well, but the difference was he had a sleep gas gun that he used to fight criminals. Um, he's not super famous, but he was big at the time. Uh, since then, in the 1970s, Jack Kirby, who's really, really famous, particularly for his work in Marvel and DC on Fantastic Four and New Gods, he had a version of the Sandman too, but his one was a bit more similar to the Morpheus one. He had some dream powers and stuff, but he's just not very famous at all. But <laughs> most people forgot him, but Neil Gaiman clearly didn't. And he took uh, both of those heroes as inspiration for his take on Morpheus in his own Sandman series. So with all those different versions of the Sandman and comics in general, you know, the comic book writers are really important. Neil Gaiman did create the Sandman, but equally comic book artists obviously deserve their due as well. And they were instrumental in bringing Sandman to life on comics. And that also played a big part in what we now see visually in the Netflix series. So there have been many Sandman artists over the years. Um, all of them have been instrumental in bringing this character to life. Um, there's so many to choose from, but who can forget Jill Thompson, Sean McManus, and then of course, the most important one of all, I would argue is Dave McKean, whose covers really set the Sandman apart and didn't look like anything else in comic book racks back in the 80s and 90s. So the reason why Dave McKean's art has been so influential is because it wasn't just traditional covers we're talking about. He used a lot of mixed media. There's photography, drawings, digital art. He really was a pioneer in many ways, um, visually. From beginning to end, Dave McKean actually did every single cover for The Sandman. So of course, fans really, really associate his work and his art with the character. Um, but about five years ago, he, he was kind of done. He decided to retire from Sandman because he'd just done enough, which is totally fair. But when Neil Gaiman started making the series, he knew that Dave McKean had to get involved. So what he did was he called him up and he said, what can you do? We need you on this show. So you might notice now, if you watch The Sandman, at the end of each episode, the end credit sequences, they've got a lot of um, unusual art, a lot of strange images that all collide in together. Um, and all of this really represents the storyline of each individual episode. But what's so great about this is it was all designed by Dave McKean. Um, and you can kind of see the influence of his mixed media covers visually now on screen. So if you've read the comics and now seen the show, you'll notice that actually this has been a pretty faithful adaptation by Netflix. Um, but essentially the Sandman is all about Morpheus. He is the king of dreaming. So as the king of dreaming, Morpheus is one of a handful of very special kind of immortal ethereal beings who represent primal forces within the universe. So he represents dream, which is why everyone calls him dream of course. And throughout the series, you'll meet other people like death, desire, and there's a few in the comics as well that we haven't seen yet. So essentially, the Sandman is very much Morpheus's story still. And at the very beginning, both in the comics and the show, Morpheus is accidentally captured by people who are looking for power, um, magic users who want to take his gifts for themselves. But they wanted to catch death. And so unfortunately for Morpheus, he's trapped in the cell of this rich douchey guy basically who wants to steal his powers, but Morpheus just sits there naked in a big glass bubble and says, no, you're not getting any of that. Eventually, of course, um, the Sandman is released. Um, and from then on, the big chunk of the first arc, both in the comics again and the series, is him trying to restore his power. And a lot of his power is imbued in some special objects of his, including his helmet and also a special ruby. And these help him control dreams, enter the dreaming world, and also have command over nightmares too. So that doesn't exactly sound like your typical superhero book, and that's because it's not. Sandman was part of the Vertigo um, Mature Audiences line, which deviated massively for things like Superman and Batman. But you know, beyond those story specifics, the reason why Sandman is so successful and so beloved by so, so many people is that it really tackles such broad universal themes, but in a very specific, unique, 
fascinating way. And Neil Gaiman's writing really toyed with the idea of what storytelling even is. So through the lens of Morpheus, this particular character, uh, Neil Gaiman tackles really fascinating ideas about what storytelling even is, um, how can we change it, how does it impact both the people here in the stories and also the ones who are telling them in the first place. Um, and that became such a really integral part of his work from then on. But really Sandman is the classic text that Neil Gaiman fans often look to now. The long journey from page to screen. So fans are super, super happy that the Sandman has finally made it to screen after many, many years, but this was not an easy process, not by any means. So the Sandman comic started in 1989, but already by 1991, Hollywood saw some potential in this series and decided to try and make a movie. Back then, one of the first big Hollywood names attached to the Sandman movie was Roger Avery. Um, he's quite well known for being good friends with Grant and Tarantino. Um, they even worked together on the script for Pulp Fiction, which won them the Oscar. So as we all now know, none of those movies ended up happening. Um, but by the end of the 90s, a lot of scripts had gone around Hollywood. Um, and actually, back in 1998, Neil Gaiman came across one that he has been quoted as saying was not just the worst Sandman script he's ever read, but it was quite easily the worst script he's ever read of anything ever. As you probably figured, that terrible 1998 script didn't get made either. Um, and then because of that, for many, many years afterwards, the Sandman just kind of floated around. But then in 2013, David S. Goya got involved. Now, he has been involved in a bunch of comic book stuff over the years, as well as big TV shows like Lost. Um, you might know him best for working on the Batman trilogy of Christopher Nolan, which is pretty much the paragon of superhero filmmaking at this point. So David S. Goya pitched the Sandman movie to Warner Brothers, and for a little while there, it really looked like this was actually going to happen. Neil Gaiman was involved, David was involved, and also Joseph Gordon-Levitt was involved. And in fact, he wasn't just gonna star in it, he was also gonna direct the Sandman movie too. But again, as we all know by now, that didn't end up happening. And by 2016, Joseph Gordon-Levitt left the project completely. So I think Joseph Gordon-Levitt was actually quite an interesting choice. Um, you know, he's done a lot of offbeat projects before. I think he's kind of got the look nailed down too. Um, so there was a lot of potential there and a lot of fans were really disappointed when he did end up dropping out. So um, if a movie was out of the question, what does that leave? TV. So Warner Brothers tried to get a Sandman show up and running and interestingly enough they actually tried to enlist Eric Kripke who is best known now as the showrunner of both Supernatural and The Boys. He did take a stab at the project but by all accounts Neil Gaiman was not a fan. We have the TV show now but just recently Neil Gaiman did address those earlier botched movie efforts again. Um, he was at Comic Con during a panel where he spoke about the fact that there's just so much Sandman material. You know there's so many arcs, so many storylines and it's so complex. How do you put all that into a two hour movie? You just can't. So unlike some of those shoddy shoddy early movie scripts, Neil Gaiman is directly involved in the script writing this time round um, and he has some co-writing credits with Alan Heinberg the creator of Young Avengers and the OC of all amazing shows that we could talk about right now, plus uh, David S. Goyer again. Cast in the Sandman. One of the big talking points around Netflix's Sandman adaptation has been the casting. So this is a big, big cast and we're talking, there's a lot of icons in there. There's a lot of really, really famous British talent. So it's really interesting that for the lead lead role of Morpheus, AKA the Sandman, Neil Gaiman and his team went for Tom Sturridge, someone who was pretty much an unknown up until this point. But interestingly enough, at Comic-Con, Neil Gaiman said that Tom Sturridge was one of the very first auditions that they saw. Comic book readers might have an idea of how Morpheus sounds in their heads, but it's really, really great to see Tom bring that to life in a way I think a lot of fans will be really happy with. The voice is quite deep, it's quite gruff, but not in a caricature way. It almost feels otherworldly, which is very much the point when it comes to Sandman. So earlier on, I mentioned there were a lot of British legends involved in the Sandman, and one of them is Jenna Coleman. You probably know her best from Doctor Who, but she's actually been in a bunch of stuff like Emmerdale, Victoria, The Serpents. So it's really great to see her add Sandman to her resume. What's really fascinating about Jenna Coleman's character is that she's taken on the role of John Constantine, a famous sorcerer DC character who's been in a bunch of other stuff. He had a Keanu Reeves film. He had, um, he also appeared in Legends of Tomorrow, the DC Arrowverse show, but, this is a twist. She's not really playing John, John Constantine. She's actually playing Joanna Constantine, a gender flip version of the character. This version of Constantine is also dark, is also messed up, also has a lot of trauma, um, as you would come to expect from the character. But there's also almost like uh, a softness, a lightness, which is a little bit different and really sets her apart from any other version of Constantine I've seen on screen before. So I think part of that comes down to Jenna Coleman's performance, of course, but I do think also the way the script really humanizes Constantine early on in episode three also kind of lends itself to this slightly new, um, arguably improved version of the character. 
It's just a shame we don't have more of Jenna Coleman in this show, really. Um, obviously, episode three was a really big moment for her, and Constantine is very pivotal to that storyline in particular. But beyond that, we don't really see Jenna again until episode, I believe, seven, when we go back in time and meet her ancestor. And to be honest, that's the drawback of having such a big cast, really. Um, it's a great cast, and we want to get to know everyone, but there's just not enough time. You know, Jenna Coleman could have been in it a lot more in theory, but if we'd had more Constantine, we wouldn't have had more from everyone else. And that's a problem that inflicts quite a few characters across these 10 episodes. It's worth noting that a lot of these casting decisions were, you know, met by fans as controversial. Comic book fans are not always to please. Sometimes they just want everything to be the exact same as it always was, even if the stories were written many, many decades ago. But The Sandman has updated itself in really great ways with its casting. Um, there are quite a few characters who have been gender flipped or have had the race changed from the comics, and in ways that really add to the world that Neil Gaiman and the team are building in a really inclusive and really interesting way that reflects the real world as well. One of these controversial cast and decisions came in the form of Kirby Howell Baptiste, uh, the Good Place star who's taken on the role of Death. In the comics, Death is very, very popular. I would argue she's probably even more popular than Morpheus, to be honest. She's easily the most popular member of the Endless in the Sandman comics. The reason why Death is so popular, I think, is because she's not really what you would expect. You know, usually we see the personification of Death or the Grim Reaper as something very dark, something to be afraid of. But this version that Neil Gaiman created back in 1989 was very, very welcoming. It showed a different side to Death as a natural order of things and why it's something that while we don't necessarily welcome, it's not something we should be afraid of. Death was first introduced in Sandman number no. 8, which was published around 1990, I believe. It's a standalone story where Death and Morpheus, they meet on a bench and they catch up. And they're siblings who just talk about life and death, and they talk about what the future holds for them as well. Um, but along the way, they also visit different people across the world who are dying. And like I mentioned before, it's, it was really something that people didn't expect. And it was a really big turning point for the comic in general, Neil Gaiman has since said. Um, it really showed people that this was more than what they expected from the beginning. This was something really special to take note of. That issue in particular actually becomes the key focus of an episode of Netflix's adaptation as well. Um, episode six starts with this exact bench scene. Um, and there are some really beautiful quotes lifted directly from the comics. Kirby really, really nails the role. Um, you know, again, it's an otherworldly being like like Morpheus, but Death has more humanity. Death has spent more time with the people who she helps pass on. And Kirby really captures this, this almost humanity that um, some of the other Endless are lacking. During casting, uh, Neil Gaiman said, it was really tough to find someone who could really discuss these crazy big metaphysical themes and ideas in such a casual, succinct way. Um, quite often it sounded very robotic apparently coming out of the actors' mouths, but Kirby got it from day one and that's why she is perfect for this role. Now you might think that comes partly from Kirby's role in The Good Place, another show that happens to deal very much with the afterlife and the nature of death. But when we spoke to her recently at a junket, she said she hadn't really made that connection up until that point. It's funny actually, you're the second person who's drawn a comparison between The Good Place and this, this role. And I hadn't done it before, which I feel very silly for not. But um, absolutely, I mean, in The Good Place, The Good Place was so like, I don't know, of course we were dealing with the afterlife, but it was it was in such a different way. Whereas, you know, this this version of death, this this idea is you have to almost take like a forensic approach to to looking at death. So another casting choice I adored was uh, Mason Alexander Park, who was cast in the role of Desire, another member of the Endless. You might know Mason Alexander Park best from Netflix's short-lived Cowboy Bebop adaptation that aired last year. Um, but this is Mason's time to shine. Desire has always been presented as androgynous and gender fluid ever since they first appeared in the comics way back in 1989. Um, and that's why Mason is such an inspired choice. Um, as a non-binary actor, Mason really leads into that aspect of the character, both visually and also in terms of mannerisms and appearance. And it's just, it's just such a joy to watch. You would expect Desire to be seductive, you know, that it's pretty much in the name, but Mason really nails that too. Um, the performance is very almost feline and animalistic, um, and it's just, it's a character you shouldn't be rooting for, but you do anyway. Not only does Mason's take on Desire actually match the comics pretty perfectly, it also cannot be overstated how important it is to have a non-binary actor play such a huge pivotal role like this. 
Let's talk about Lucifer. Now we can't talk about the cast of The Sandman without also talking about Gwendolyn Christie's amazing take on Lucifer. In the comics, Lucifer is introduced early on and in many ways is similar to their biblical counterpart. You know, they are the fallen angel, they are Satan, they rule over hell. And that's also true in the show as well. But what's really interesting about the original version in the comics is how they were portrayed as very androgynous on the page. Um, in a very sim in a similar way to Desire, in fact. Back in the day, Neil Gaiman cited David Bowie as an inspiration for the character's visual look. It's easy to see then why Gwendolyn Christie is such a perfect match for this. Um, she looks identical to the comic book version and it is a joy to see. Like a few of the fan favorites from this series, Lucifer isn't in the show as much as we would like, but saying that it makes the impact all the more powerful. Gwendolyn Christie's presence on screen has always been quite striking and she really uses that to good effect here. You really believe that she is the ruler of hell, she is a fallen angel and she is someone you do not want to fuck with. Despite the amazing performance Gwendolyn gives, there might be some fans who are wondering, where's Tom Ellis? Why isn't he Lucifer? While there might be some rights issues, actually the biggest obstacle is just that the Lucifer show is very, very different from the Sandman in terms of tone. Um, while they both come from the same comic books originally, the Lucifer show really went off the rails of its own wild, campy take on the devil in LA being a private detective. That's not what the Sandman's about and Tom Ellis's take on the character just would not make sense in this world. In one of his regular replies to fans on Twitter, Neil Gaiman actually said as much as well, arguing that why would we cast Tom Ellis? Why would we bring in this version? As great as it is, when we can forge something new that's more comic book faithful with Gwendolyn Christie. As great as Gwendolyn is, Lucifer also needs to look the part visually. And thankfully, the Sandman does such a great job with this. Um, the outfits look amazing. The hair is wonderful. And most importantly of all, those wings really do look demonic. Everyone has their preconception of what hell might look like on screen. Um, and the Sandman does a really good job of capturing the busy, frenzied, and really messed up tone from the comics. Of course, this location is really key when we first meet Lucifer early on in series one. And excitingly enough, it's also very key at the very end of season one as well, right in the final scene. What's next for the Sandman? At the end of season one, quite a few episodes after Morpheus embarrasses Lucifer in a battle of wits and power, she's visited by Azazel, a demon who works in the realm alongside her. Together, they're plotting Morpheus' downfall. In fact, Lucifer is apparently planning something that will make God livid. So we are very excited to see what that is gonna look like when season two eventually arrives, assuming of course Netflix does renew it for a second season. Looking ahead to season two, there is so much source material to work with. And you know, with season one, it shows the team weren't afraid of picking part different sections and bring them together to create something new and we expect that's likely to happen again for season two. Fingers crossed season two does at least one episode based on the iconic issue where Morpheus follows a cat and explores his dreams. Of course there's also a really big thing brewing with Desire and Morpheus. It turns out that a lot of the bad things that happened in season one were actually engineered by Desire all along which means they're definitely going to be playing an even bigger part moving forward. And that's one particularly important arc that we're confident will definitely come from the comics into the show. Given that season one actually had a surprising amount of connections to the wider DC universe, we would expect to see some more cameos moving forward in season two as well. Don't know what we're talking about? Well, actually, it turns out there were a few cheeky little links that the team put in, which only diehard comic book fans probably spotted. So in the source material, the Justice League actually appeared very early on, um, and throughout the comic book run, Neil Gaiman wasn't a big fan of bringing in wider DC stuff, but every now and again, Superman or Batman would pop in to say hi. Now that sort of happens too in season one. Um, the most obvious example is in episode eight. Now this one opens with Jed, Rose Walker's brother, where he's trapped in a weird kitsch superhero fantasy world of his own making. Well, a demon's making. The nightmare that's controlling this scenario keeps bringing up a kind of supervillain Rolodex of golden age villains from classic DC comics like The Flash. Uh, we can see Captain Cold, who's a really important character from Legends of Tomorrow, as well as way more obscure characters like Johnny Sorrow and the Phantom of the Fair. But crucially, if you look really closely, you can also see some action figures of classic DC Justice League heroes like The Flash and Wonder Woman, and there's a couple of Batmans hiding there too. Maybe, just maybe, we might even see some of these characters in the Sandman season two moving forward. Um, but only if it makes sense. It doesn't seem likely, but we're gonna hold out hope anyway. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and let us know in the comments. 
And on top of that, we've also got a bunch of Sandman interview content online. Uh, it does stuff with the cast and also Neil Gaiman himself. So be sure to check that out on digitalspy.com.